Good afternoon and welcome to today's IAC webinar, Venus Evaluation and Treatment in the Era of COVID-19, Pre, Peri, Post. My name is Kelly Baer and I'm the Creative Design Manager with Marketing Communications at IAC. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to review a few technical matters and let you know how you can participate in today's session. We would like today's webinar to be interactive, so we encourage you to submit questions. To do so, use the questions tab located on the left side of your screen. Please submit your questions anytime during the webinar as we will monitor questions throughout the presentation and try to answer as many of them as possible during the Q&A period. Also on the left sidebar, please note the resources tab. Click on this tab for a link to today's handouts, including a PDF copy of these PowerPoint slides. Select the file name to download the handout. Lastly, in the lower left of the player, please note the request support button. If you experience any technical problems during this webinar, click this button. A technical expert will be there to assist you with any issues you may have. For those who like to take notes during the presentation, look to the right of the slides and click the notes tab. There you will see a white text box where you can take notes on today's webinar. These notes will be emailed to you automatically at the end of the session. To be eligible for the SVU CME credit, you must be registered, logged into this webinar, then complete the survey. The survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of the live session and also be available from the IAC webinar portal for three business days. If you're viewing this webinar in a group, please be sure you are also individually registered and logged into this webinar on another computer or device so that we have record of your attendance today. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be posted at a later time for on-demand viewing. This webinar is a joint presentation of IAC and SVU. And now I would like to introduce today's guest presenter, Dr. Manu Agarwal. Dr. Agarwal is a physician, board certified in family medicine and aesthetic laser certified, specializing in venous disease. She is also a diplomat of the American Board of Venous and Lymphatic Medicine. She is the medical director of Vein Care Center Laser Specialists in Lima, Ohio, with satellites in Selena and Findlay. A true expert in the field, and we are happy to have her with us today. And with that said, I will now turn this webinar over to today's speaker, Dr. Manu Agarwal. Doctor? Thank you, Kelly, and thank you, IAC, for asking me to um, speak on this very pertinent and relative topic today. Um, I hope that all of our listeners and viewers today find it very useful. Um, some of the things we will talk about are a little bit anecdotal for what we've been through, but some of them are going to be um, some of the current literature and current recommendations um, in the era of COVID-19. Um, and so I'm going to first start with um, our IAC accreditations, we have been IAC accredited in vascular um, ultrasound since 2007, and we were one of the 50, I'm proud to say, to obtain our venous, our, our vein center accreditation um, in 2015. And so um, we're up for reaccreditation here this coming year, so we look forward to maintaining our accreditation. And I do um, want to give a shout out to IAC to helping us maintain these accreditations. I think they're really important um, in providing <clears throat> consistent and um, continuous care to our patients. So I'm gonna first show you a picture of um, my staff here. So this was pre-COVID. Um, we have a certified lymphedema therapist. We have um, three registered vascular technologists, a nurse, a nurse practitioner, practice manager, and two front office staff. Um, during COVID, uh, we did lose two of staff members, so that's been a little bit of a challenge for us. We have um, hired another lymphedema therapist um, who is going to start in January, and then we've also had to hire another um, RVT who's going to be our technical um, director as well, um, starting here in this next couple weeks. So COVID has been a little bit of a change for us, for sure, um, has Put a little bit of stress on us. Um, we did mention in the slide title about post-COVID. I'm not really sure what's going to happen post-COVID. I think we're still in peri-COVID. Um, I don't know what it's like in your communities, but here our hospitals are on diversion. Uh, we're filled with 
COVID floors um, and um, our nurse practitioners are actually getting recruited to work in the ICU. And I think physicians are going to be asked to be recruited to work on these floors as well. So I think there's going to be still some changes that we're going to see coming down the road. But I'm going to try to focus on um, the uh, objectives here, which we're going to be talking about how COVID has brought on a multitude of changes um, and give an outlook on how it's affected uh, the Venus practice management roles, um, the front staff roles, as well as the ultrasound technologist roles. So I'm going to start with the practice management roles. Um, so as you know, as most of you probably went through this, we stopped all of our elective cases back in um, April. So last week of March was kind of our last week. We stopped all of our elective cases in April. Fortunately, we were able to continue to see patients as needed. So if a patient had a venous ulcer or a venous bleed, um, we were able to continue seeing those patients in person. We had very limited office hours. One of the things that I think if um, you guys are not taking advantage of is um, something to definitely consider is telemedicine. So we use doxy.me. Um, it is a free telemedicine service. It is HIPAA compliant. Patients can um, be scheduled to do a telemedicine visit um, with you through your scheduling staff. Um, and then we are able to do an audio only or audio and video. So a lot of patients have smartphones right now, and you can actually visually see their concern, whether it's a bleeding vessel or, you know, a venous ulcer or phlebitis or something like that of nature. And then you can kind of determine whether or not those patients need to be seen in person. So we did utilize that quite a bit in April to determine whether or not those patients are non-essential and, um, or I mean, not, not a non-essential, if to determine if they are essential to be seen. So we were able to kind of triage them that way um, and then determine if we needed to perform an ultrasound to call in our ultrasound technologist to come in um, and see patients with us. We also did implement um, a COVID-19 protocol in our practice. We use Dropbox in our practice, which I think is a really nice tool um, because it can go on to all of your iPad devices if you guys use those in your practice um, so that all of your staff is available to access the Dropbox and look at your protocols, look at before and afters, um, whatever you want to stick on your Dropbox for the practice. We find it to be really helpful. We also dropped in um, our limited ultrasound protocols at that time. So we did write up a limited ultrasound protocol during COVID-19 um, where we had limited um, pictures of deep system as well as the superficial system. Um, and then we were able to do those reduced protocols through the month of April and May. And then um, in June, we went back to full force and you know kept doing the uh, normal protocols. So you know, from our normal initial consultations for patients, we were taking about 60 images um, and then during COVID, we were probably about 20 to 25 images to limit contact with our technologists as well as the rest of the staff to the patient and vice versa. And it worked out really nicely for us. I did drop a phone line to my friends at the IAC and just made sure that we were okay given our accreditation to limit our ultrasounds. And they were, of course, very supportive um, and understanding as things were evolving very quickly. And so I think that's always a great resource. Some of the other things on the practice management side that we've kind of seen is the shortages. So right now, um, we are seeing shortages in gloves as well as surgical gowns. Um, we have purchased uh, disposable gloves from Amazon, um, and we're having a hard time maintaining our supplies um, with gowns. And so we actually purchased reusable gowns where we are washing them and laundering them ourselves and then autoclaving them um, for reuse in our practice. So it's been, it's been a little bit of a shift for us. I'm sure that you guys have also noticed that as well. Um, we also did make some clothing requirement changes in our practice in terms of where we're asking all of our employees to change their clothes prior to leaving the office 
so that they're not taking um, potential fomites of COVID with them back home um, and putting them in a plastic bag and, you know, washing them at home, or we're happy to launder them here as well. So those are some of the practice um, roles that we've ch seen change in terms of COVID. Um, our ultrasound technologist roles have definitely changed, which I'm sure a lot of you have noticed as well. Um, there's a little bit more pressure um, on our technologists to make sure that patients are wearing their masks. Um, we're trying to make sure that our technologists are wearing their masks as well as using shields or eye protection and um, disposable gloves with every patient. Again, we're limiting our patient contact um, in the very beginning when COVID um, first came out. And um, this, again, was very much supported by the SVU as well as the IAC. Our staff was spending a little bit more time in between patients cleaning bed handles and um, door handles as well. You know, of course, the bed and the ultrasound, those were kind of already being done, but just taking those extra minutes to um, uh, clean the surfaces and make sure that we're not um, increasing our risk of getting our technologist infected with COVID. Um, we already had a cleaning protocol in place for our ultrasound probes and machines, but there were no real changes. But then um, the IAIUM had come out with some official statements, which is one of the resources that I've attached for you guys um, to look at because it was kind of interesting um, to determine what is the effective um, cleaning protocols, what is low level disinfection versus high level disinfection. Um, so I think this is a great official statement that all of you can implement into your practices or into your offices and labs. Um, so you're gonna be using low level disinfection basically for intact skin um, procedures and you're going to be using high level disinfection when you have bodily fluids involved or some open skins like venous ulcers and wounds. So I hope you find that attachment as useful as we did. The front staff roles definitely increased for us as well. Um, we did lock our doors for the entire month of May, um, as well as April, of course. Um, so we had one entry and one exit for all patients. Patients were not allowed to touch door handles um, we made sure we opened the door for all of our patients, and we continue to do so at this point, especially since we're kind of seeing an, a ramp up in cases again. We did implement desk shields for all of our front staff. Um, patients had to wait outside in the parking lot, to call us and let us know on their arrival. Um, and then if they needed stockings or any sort of other supplies, um, whether it was a lymphedema wraps or Velcro wraps and things like that, patients would have to call, make an appointment for them so that we didn't have just random people coming in um, and being able to maintain six foot of social distancing. Um, front staff was also making sure patients, if they did not have a mask prior to going back into the ultrasound rooms, that they had masks on um, and understood the rules and regulations prior to going back so that the staff was kept um, safe. The other thing we found during COVID um, is that a lot of patients, of course, had changes in their jobs, changes in insurance coverage, changes um, in a lot of aspects of their lives, but they weren't necessarily relaying those to us as patients. Um, so we've ramped up our um, uh, with the way that we obtain insurance cards and driver's license and make sure that their insurance cards are valid. Um, and so that's something that we've increased the, the number of times that the insurance card is validated um, within our system of the electronic medical record. And so I think that's something that we're going to see an issue continuing going down the road to make sure that the patients have valid insurance. Um, we do have an indemnification form for our patients when they first come in. They sign it every single time that they've come in. If they've had a procedure last week and they're coming in for their one-week ultrasound to rule out um, DVT and assure um, successful treatment of their um, laser treatment from the week prior, they will sign that indemnification form last week and they will sign it this week again. So 
Um, patients have been really good about signing that form. I think it's important for practices to have this form. It's been recommended across the, all, all areas to make sure that patients do not come back and blame you for getting COVID from your practice. I don't think that that's going to happen, but I think it's always good to make sure that you have that as well. Um, we used to ask if patients were traveling. We don't really care anymore because that's obviously not a concern. Um, and then the other thing is we're also making sure that patients are maintaining six feet in the waiting room. As we opened up our waiting room back in June um, and marked it off and things like that. So um, let me see here. So key points I wanted to go over with you guys um, is making sure that you're assuring um, and advocating for your staff's safety um, to ensure that your patients have access and care, um, but you want to make sure that it's consistent from your desk front desk staff all the way to your back staff and in between, um, making sure that everybody is on the same page with the, with your protocol for COVID-19, um, making sure that patients are wearing their masks, making sure employees are wearing masks. What we did in our practice um, for mask shortage is we actually got N99 material from the operating room. So that material is actually used to wrap surgical instruments. And so we were able to obtain that because once they come out of autoclave, it's kind of thrown away. So we took that N99 material and had masks made locally, and we actually launder them, and then we autoclave them um, in between each use. And so that's been really helpful for us because we don't feel like um, we need to waste surgical masks, and we're able to have these reusable masks with N95 material. Um, we're continuing to advocate for shields or goggle uses with our patients uh, or with our staff. Um, I think we need to keep considering shortages. I think the supply chain is still going to be continue to be an issue, um, whether it's gowns, gloves, um, and supplies as we come um, down the road. So I think it's really important for us to stock up um, because who knows what's going to come around the corner here in these next couple weeks. Um, I think that you should have a good cleaning protocol, um, especially for your ultrasound technologists and the entire office staff. We went to one pen per um, staff. So we really have no other pens um, in each room, which uh, I think in all practices, people are pen hoarders. And I had to get rid of a lot of pens in my office. Um, so everybody has one pen. Um, we have a clean pile, we have a dirty pile, we wipe them off in between. Um, and then also to make sure that you're documenting changes to your protocols, um, whether it's on your ultrasound side, your cleaning side, making sure that um, you're documenting in your notes as to why you're doing a limited ultrasound um, and what your findings are. And then when you do your letters or prior authorizations to insurance companies to making sure that they're aware of why you have a limited protocol. Um, I had to do some peer-to-peer -peer reviews during the COVID-19 um, early on and because we had some limited protocols um, and insurance companies were pretty um, lenient on it. I think now we're coming up to the end of the year and we're noticing that insurance companies are kind of getting a little bit more um, sticky, if you will, when it comes to some of the ultrasound findings. Um, right now, we're kind of dealing with one with Medical Mutual where um, they, if you are wanting to do an ambulatory phlebectomy on a patient with calf varices, they want to see saphenofemoral junction reflex, which is completely unrelated. So, I think we're seeing some discrepancies in some of the ultrasound or in some of the insurance requirements. And so I think we're going to see more of an issue of, of that going down the road as well. So um, coming to the future, some of the things, because again, some, the future with post COVID, I think is a little bit unknown. Um, we did have an interesting case a couple weeks ago that we had an endovenous laser ablation to the left great saphenous vein for a patient who had venous insufficiency. We also performed an ambulatory phlebectomy on that patient. 
And three weeks, he came back for his one week follow up. And then three weeks after that one week follow up. So we're looking about a month later, um, a patient ended up with shortness of breath, went to the ER, um, had a negative SARS um, or COVID-19 test, but had ground glass opacities on his CT scan and had bilateral pulmonary emboli. So I'm not sure there, again, there's no studies right now and there's no um, stance for vascular procedures and doing anticoagulation, but, you know, with COVID-19 and we know the increased risk of um, thrombosis with COVID-19, I'm, I, I would be interesting to see um, how this all progresses down the road, especially for outpatient procedures, such as a lot of us are doing. Um, there are some studies actually that we're talking about um, ultrasound technologists, especially in vascular studies um, in the hospital since COVID has sort of created this um, thrombus formation in a lot of patients that ultrasound technologists are really much more needed. So, um, you know, it's definitely ultrasound technologists are being utilized more. Um, there was a study that I was reading about yesterday. I can't recall exactly where it was from, but um, talking about how ultrasound is still a great easy tool to use to diagnose lower extremity and upper extremity DVTs in patients that are hospitalized in the ICU with COVID-19. So your roles have definitely um, been uh, increased and touted especially in light of COVID-19. So um, I think ultrasound technologists are playing a key role um, during this time. In terms of the future, in terms of also treatments that we're kind of seeing, um, a lot of discussion about kind of no touch, like can we actually diagnose a patient without touching them, <laughs> um, which is a little you know, odd for me to think about. Just, you know, I've been out of training for 15 years and so um, you know, it, everything was touch, put your stethoscope on. And so, but I think we're starting to see some things like high intensity focused ultrasound. Um, Dr. Mike, um, I think uh, Dr. Whiteley from the Whiteley Clinic in the UK had done some nice studies with it. So, and we're starting to see that kind of come now into the United States. Is this going to be something where your endovenous laser treatments are going to be changed with using um, high food treatments? Um, Dr. Ari Safra out of Miami actually came out with a new um, method of thermal evaluation of venous incompetence. It's kind of a touchless evaluation. It was a nice article that was in Vein Magazine this month. Um, <clears throat> so I think there's going to be some movement of that as we move forward as well and something for you guys to sort of keep an eye on um, as you see uh, what new technologies are out there. Um, <clears throat> we're also, of course, like I talked about seeing some insurance changes. I did add, um, an article for you guys called the appropriate use. It was published, um, just recently this year in the journal of vascular surgery. Um, and I attached that called the appropriate use criteria. I think it was really helpful. It is also one of IAC's requirements, um, for your protocols to determine whether or not an ultrasound is appropriate on your patient's. Um, we are going to be seeing a CMS decline as of right now from my readings about an 11% decrease in reimbursements um, for diagnostic ultrasound. And so I think it's going to be really important um, that we're utilizing some of these appropriate use criteria um, moving forward. So I hope you find that um, helpful as well. Um, so I wanted to add a little bonus because um, I, I feel like everybody needs a little bonus this time. Um, everybody's a little bit under stress. So I wanted to talk a little bit about some skin changes that some of, especially the ultrasound technologists may be seeing um, and physicians. I know uh, most of you probably know what these skin findings are, but I wanted to go over some of these things um, because again, when with COVID-19, um, some of the skin findings you'll see may give you a better idea of what's going on with a patient um, before you decide to do an ultrasound on them. So, of course, coronaflebectasia um, on the medial ankle 
Um, we always talk about, you know, the that venous disease is kind of like the iceberg, um, where what you see on the surface of the skin can kind of give you a clue on what's going on underneath. Um, and so Corona is kind of one of those ones where you'll see a lot of um, venous cups, the red and blue telangiectasias, you may see some hemosiderin staining on the ankle where it's a brownish discoloration because of the blood deposits in that area. Um, it can be an indication of chronic venous insufficiency. Um, this was a nice publication, um, again, in JVS in 2012. And so I think it's really important for um, folks to recognize some of these skin changes. Um, even family practice and podiatrists, a lot of times, um, corona is one of those early signs that you can see in CVI. Um, and I think it gets missed a lot. Um, I think patients are told that, you know, it's just old age, or there's nothing to do, or there's nothing going on, you're just gonna have to deal with it. But I think sometimes it, um, it's kind of one of those early, um, or early skin changes that you can see in patients that may give you a clue that something else may be going on there. Atrophy blanche, um, it's kind of, I, even though it's not the prettiest thing to see, it's kind of one of my favorite words. Um, I think, I don't know why, maybe it's because of the way it's spelled or something, but um, it's always a white star shaped. It's a depressed plaque-like lesion. Um, sometimes these areas are pretty friable so they can bleed very easily. Um, you can actually see this in patients who have um, a coagulopathy or a vasculopathy of some sort. Um, so sometimes you'll see this in patients and they do not have any venous insufficiency. It's also a clinical sign that there may be something else going on and these patients may need worked up otherwise. Um, so I think it's really important to recognize um, atrophy blanche. Sometimes you'll see it um, once an once a ulcer is healed. Um, sometimes you can see the skin change as well. Lipodermatosclerosis. So again, one of the other one of these other favorite words of mine um, in venous medicine. Um, it's a woody like firm firmness to the skin. Um, so a lot of times the wood like firmness to the skin occurs over a long period of time because you have chronic inflammation. Um, and when you have chronic inflammation, you're creating an acidic environment in the skin. And a lot of times patients will have um, proteolytic enzymes in this area because of the acidic environment. Um, form scar tissue, form woody, firm skin. So it's a chronic problem for a lot of patients and they can develop lipodermato over time. They can get hyperpigmentation. Um, oftentimes they may look like an inverted champagne glass or a bowling pin um, because of the sclerosis and fibrotic changes that you'll see in the skin. Because you're getting fibrotic skin changes, these patients are also more prone to having swelling and recurrent cellulitis. And so it's really important to recognize patients who have um, LPD to make sure that you're not missing it and you're addressing um, the underlying cause so that these patients are not hospitalized over and over or being on antibiotics chronically um, with no end. Um, <clears throat> it's very similar sometimes to necrobiosis lipoidica. So another favorite, one of my words, I feel like a total nerd, but I, um, this is one of those other ones where you can see in, um, diabetic patients. So it looks very similar to venous insufficiency. Um, so a good history is really important for these patients because sometimes with necrobiosis, you can get recurrent ulcers and wounds as well. Um, so if you see patients who have recurrent ulcers, recurrent wounds, um, making sure that they have a good history to make sure you're not missing uh, some of the diabetic changes that can occur in the leg as well. Okay. Venous eczema, another one of my favorite things to see in our practice because oftentimes um, the varicose veins under the eczema kind of gets ignored. So um, patients will come in with chronic steroid use, chronic redness, um, chronic itchiness. It feels just like eczema, but then the varicose vein underneath kind of gets ignored. And they're like, well, I don't know why I have eczema. Well, it's venous eczema. So 
Um, you can get hyperpigmentation or post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation with these patients as well with hemocytorin staining. Um, and so it's really important to recognize um, some of these other skin changes that you may see with patients who have venous disease. Um, it doesn't have to necessarily be over varicose veins. You can have a patient, we had a patient with great saphenous vein insufficiency, and he had venous eczema all the way down from his saphenofemoral junction to his mid-calf following the entire course of the great saphenous vein. Um, I was hesitant to say for sure it was due to that, but once we removed his varicose veins and um, closed his great saphenous vein, his venous eczema disappeared. So another early um, early skin change that you can see um, that can get progressively worse. We've seen venous eczema, especially in pregnant patients with varicose veins. Um, and so a lot of times their obstetricians will not put them on a steroid cream. Um, and so these women tend to be pretty miserable with itching, um, and there are some other topical agents that are non-steroidal based that can be used to successfully treat these patients. So again, another um, skin finding that's really important to recognize early and get treated early so that you do not have the discoloration um, and skin compromise that we see there. Um, the other one that I wanted to show was the effects of pregnancy and varicose veins. So this patient came to us while she was pregnant. Obviously, the picture on the left, she's eight months pregnant. Her leg looks terrible. She looks like a classic great saphenous vein insufficiency. Um, and so, of course, you know, the hemodynamics are very different for pregnant patients. Um, we do not see those patients back until three months postpartum. Um, and so we fit them with compression stockings, um, assure that they're taking good care of their skin, making sure that it's staying hydrated so they do not have any um, bleeds or any breakdown of their skin. Um, and then you can see on the right or on the you know, right hand side there, patient did not have any procedures. This was three months postpartum. You can see that the varicose veins are much less pronounced, and um, this patient did have a great saphenous vein insufficiency. It was very patchy, um, but her leg was completely asymptomatic post-pregnancy, so she's being maintained with compression stockings for C2-level disease there. So it's really important, again, to recognize with pregnancy because this patient may decide to get pregnant again. And the picture on the um, left-hand side shows what she looks like eight months pregnant, but now she decides to get pregnant again. That picture could look much worse. And so um, we do discuss with patients to have their venous insufficiency taken care of sooner rather than later um, because once they get pregnant again, increases their, um, of course, their hemodynamics are changed, they're more risk for coagulopathy and superficial venous thrombophlebitis. Um, and so those patients who have extensive disease may opt to have their veins treated prior to a subsequent pregnancy. Um, Pregnancy-related venous disease, it's, it's pretty high out there. It's 30% of women. Um, like I said, it can progressively get with, worse with each pregnancy. Um, and we've even had patients come in with thrombosed labia um, following delivery. Um, and you always want to make sure that those patients do not have extension of their superficial venous thrombophlebitis into the deep system of the pelvic veins. So that's another one to kind of keep an eye out for as well. So I kind of went fast. <laughs> um, and I guess we're up to the question and answer session. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Agarwal. At this time, we'll begin the Q&A session. And from IAC Vein Center, I'd like to introduce Laura Humphreys, our Director of Accreditation. She'll be assisting with the Q&A session today. Laura, would you like to start us off? Sure. Thank you, Kelly. And a big thanks to Dr. Agarwal for a great presentation. Um, we do have quite a few questions here, so I do think we will be able to take up some of this time. Um, first, we have a question about the ultrasound protocol, and this particular person is asking if you could share what you consider your limited protocol during this time. Sure, great question. So 
for a limited protocol, if a patient um, for so our normal consultation protocol would be seeing the patient for both legs, we do a complete deep system as well as a superficial system. So during the limited protocol time, what we did do is we did still continue to check the common femoral, saphenofemoral junction um, with compression and Doppler. And then we also continue to do a mid-fem and a popliteal as well. Um, and only if necessary, um, we would do a PT peroneals. So the deep system was a limited, little bit limited. Um, usually we do a proximal fem, um, mid fem, and distal fem. Um, so we just cut it down to the mid fem and still continue to do the common fem as well as, you know, at the junction there. Um, and we continued to do the pop. So we sort of decreased a couple of the femoral pictures. We also decreased peroneals PTs unless we had a significant suspicion for a DVT, which again, during COVID time, we, it was rather rare. Um, so we felt pretty comfortable with that limited protocol. On the superficial system side, what we did was we um, went straight to the source. So you have a patient with a bleed that's on the medial calf um, with skin changes, chronophlebectasia, hemosiderin staining, hyperpigmentation. We just went directly to the great saphenous vein to make sure um, that that was not the culprit um, and just went directly to the superficial um, vein that could be likely causing um, the issue. So we would skip the small saphenous of uh, the superior extension um, or the anterior and posterior accessory unless they were contributing to the issue at hand. Great, we have um, quite a few questions about ultrasound. Um, so I'm gonna try and lump those together. I have a question here um, for your COVID inpatients. Are you still using the more limited protocol or are you using full protocol for the COVID inpatients? So we are a private practice. We are outpatient. Um, we do not do anything at the hospital, but I will tell you, um, I think at the hospital side here in our community, um, they did not do a limited protocol. Um, I think it's going to be very dependent on um, your medical director as well as your technical director and comfort level. Um, you know, I think sometimes our ultrasound technologists here are a little bit spoiled because they have a physician as well as our nurse practitioner that's available to them immediately. We can review images and look at the patient immediately. So I think in that regards, um, our technologists are a little bit spoiled and we love that. Um, in the hospital setting, I think it, unless you guys can come together with your technical director and medical director and come up with a nice protocol that you guys feel comfortable, um, that things are not going to get missed, um, that's probably what I would recommend. Um, I wouldn't be surprised, to be honest, if we come down this path in the next couple weeks where we're having to go back to closing our doors and doing limited protocols again, given the rise in cases. So I think it's important that if you're questioning this and if you're wanting to create a limited protocol to do it now um, so that you have one available, say another pandemic comes down the road, I think it's just important to have something available for your staff. So for those um, limited exams, would you also consider those for patients who are having serial ultrasounds um, for upper or lower DVT studies? Maybe they're being seen uh, repetitive studies every five or seven days um, while they're being anticoagulated. Would you still consider limited exams for those patients, even if there was no change in the symptoms? So if a patient had a DVT to begin with, I would not limit, I would not um, decrease my protocol for that patient. So if they, if they truly had a DVT and you're doing serial ultrasounds on a weekly basis or um, every two weeks or whatever your protocol may be, I would definitely not decrease my protocol for that. So do you stop the test if you find a DVT before completing the exam? I mean, do you, for your limited exam, if you find a DVT, is that good enough? And then you just stop and consider that a limited exam at that point? No, we would go back and doing the entire for a DVT. 
see, we would go back and do an entire protocol for that. Okay, um, so let's just move on a little bit. Um, someone's asking if you could review how you're making your own uh, masks. You talked about the ones you're doing with the autoclave. Can you provide a little bit more information about those? Sure. So um, if you connect with your hospital or um, anywhere that has N99 material, which is, again, that wrap that you see on autoclaved instruments in the OR, that once that's put out to the OR, that material is actually thrown away. And so um, we just obtained that from the hospital. Um, and then we just used actually one of our staff members, that mom or mother-in-law is an avid sewer. And so she just created masks for us out of the N99 material, um, including the straps as well as the mask portion itself. We can actually put um, a filter into it um, as well if we wanted to, um, but we feel really comfortable it being a 99 material. Um, we wash it in the washer. Um, we've been using the same one since April. They've held up great. Um, and then we autoclave them like we autoclave our instruments um, and we feel really comfortable um, wearing them. So they're not fitted, but again, we are not in the hospital. We're in an outpatient private practice. Okay. Um, speaking of cleaning equipment, what are you doing differently now to clean your um, ultrasound machine and your probe? Really, we aren't doing anything different, um, to be honest, because we have a cleaning protocol for our probe as well as the machines based on manufacturing um, guidelines. And so we're not really doing that much different with it. I mean, we're still using ultrasound probe covers for patients who may have open wounds or ulcers. Um, honestly, there's not too much has changed there. I think the only thing that's really changed is the technologist in between patients is really spending a little bit extra time watching or wiping down door handles, um, you know, things of, and, you know, wiping down the handle on the stool that the patient's standing on, things of that nature. But from an ultrasound standpoint, not really much has changed for us. Okay, do you have any information um, or know anything about sterilization um, with UV light for the ultrasound probes? Hmm. You know, that's an interesting question. I guess I would probably check with the manufacturer. I just don't know if I, I would suspect that the crystals and the probe would be okay. Um, but honestly, I would really, really make sure that you're following the manufacturer guidelines only because I wouldn't want something to happen to the probe and then it'd be related to the cleaning process, because then, um, you know, would potentially not be under warranty. Um, you know, I think a wipe is perfectly fine. If you read the AIUM official statements, one of the one of the nice um, recommendations was to even just use a little Q-tip and kind of get into the crevices around the probe um, if you want. Um, but there are manufacturer guidelines on what to use on the probe versus what to use on the machine to protect the crystals. Okay. Um, have you adjusted any of your scheduling to allow for more time between patients um, to, to, to clean the rooms and clean the equipment? So we did. Um, in the beginning, we had a little bit of extra time. Our patients were spaced out a little bit. Um, because of our loss of our ultrasound technologist and one just joining, um, we've seen a huge ramp up in, in our practice in terms of um, patients requesting treatment for the varicose veins. I think people are a little bit concerned about having a shutdown again. Um, it's also the end of the year, so it is the busiest time of year for us. Um, so as much as I'd like to say, yes, we've given some extra time, I think I will say as a team, we are helping each other flip rooms and clean spaces together. Um, you know, so I can't say now that we're allowing extra time. Um, I think the wipes that we have are pretty quick and easy to wipe off flat surfaces. Um, so yes and no. <laughs> 
So, so you mentioned that, um, you know, this, you've coming up, you're coming up in your busy season. Um, are you back to your normal schedule performing all your services and elective procedures? Yes, we were as of June. So we went back to doing electives as soon as we were allowed to um, a couple months ago, and we are very, very busy. Okay, so do you have any specific criteria for elective procedures um, or now are just all electives being done? Um, all electives being done. So we're okay. not we're not beholden to anything that we can't do. I mean, there was a there was a break for elective procedures, but now there hasn't been any, at least to my knowledge, there hasn't been a uh, guideline that says no elective procedures. Okay, I know you, you kind of alluded to this, but um, do you, what can you share to encourage us as we go into another surge? Do you expect that everything is just going to, you know, shut down again? Is there anything that you can share about that? Well, I think one of the important things to recognize is that there is going to be an increased number of cases, um, especially with the flu season coming around. I think in general, um, we're going to see a lot of more symptoms for patients. Um, and it's going to be difficult to tell, is it the flu or is it COVID-19 or is it something else? Um, that's why I would encourage you as well as your staff um, and team members to come up with a cleaning protocol, come up with a limited ultrasound protocol, um, being ready to make some changes in terms of scheduling. Do you space patients apart? Um, for a while, we were actually doing phone call triage the day before a patient would come um, and asking them about symptoms. Um, now, patients are so um, considerate that we're having patients calling us a couple days before their appointment or even the night before, which is totally fine, um, saying, hey, I don't feel really good. Um, I'm not fevered, but I just don't want to take a chance. So I think it's really important to set a standard for your patients, whether you send them an email or send them a letter or put it on your Facebook page, social media page or website so that you kind of establish a standard within the practice that say, you know what, if you're not feeling good, don't come here. Um, I think patients need to be aware of that um, so that they're not coming and showing up when they're not feeling so good. And again, maybe using the telemedicine would be really helpful, um, having your physicians use the telemedicine to determine if a patient does need to come into the lab for an ultrasound. Mm -hmm. With that being said, we have a question about um, taking patients' temperatures. Are you, are you still taking patients' te temperatures or have you been um, prior to them entering the office? No, we used to do it. We did, we did it for about a couple days and then we realized that the thermometers were inaccurate. Um, everybody was like hypothermic. Um, and so we didn't feel like we were getting an accurate temperature reading. Um, patients were asymptomatic. Um, you know, I think I feel comfortable saying that I think a temperature is completely irrelevant. Patients can be completely asymptomatic and still have COVID. Um, so we're not taking temperatures. Um, we, we don't feel that it's really helpful in our decision-making process um, or even helping with the spread of COVID in our practice. Okay, great. Um, have you seen any new quality improvement projects that have come from this virus in regards to private practice? Quality improvement projects. Hmm. I mean, I don't know. Can they be a little bit more specific? Are, are they looking in terms of like cleaning or I haven't really seen it. Um, I'm not, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. Hopefully, maybe they'll come on and respond to that. Um, in, in the meantime, have you seen a change in any of the complication rates of your procedures um, due to COVID? You know, and that's a great question. Um, I have not seen any complication rates um, since we've been doing procedures uh, during COVID time. But the one case that I alluded to during the discussion, it made me wonder um, for these asymptomatic patients and we're doing these procedures, are we going to see an increased risk of um, DVT 
post procedure, I I don't know. I mean, I don't think we know um, enough yet to say that we're going to see an increased DVT rate post procedure in these patients that may have COVID nineteen. Um, you know, I don't know. I don't. I haven't seen an increased risk yet, but it'll be interesting to see as time goes on um, if COVID will actually be labeled as a risk for DVT. Um, and if we treat these patients prophylactically now, prior to any procedure, I, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see how that kind of pans out. Okay. Um, I know you mentioned that, you know, you're no longer t- taking temperatures. Um, for your patients that are having elective procedures, do you require them to have a COVID test prior? No, we do not. Okay. Sorry, the questions are just coming in. It's hard for me to um, <laughs> keep track of them here. Um, do you know of any disposable cups for ABI or PVR studies um, so that they can use for patients who may be suspected of having COVID-19 or have COVID-19? And if not, do you know the best way to disinfect um, the cough? Yeah, so I don't know of any disposable cuffs. Um, I am sure that you probably, there may be some cuff covers um, that may be available through the manufacturer. But honestly, um, we just wipe down everything um, with a Sani wipe or um, a pro, I think they're called Protex wipes. Um, they're hydrogen peroxide wipes. Um, I think that's sufficient enough to wipe those down between each patient um, and then have them dry. Um, I feel comfortable with that method of cleaning so that you're not spreading, you know, germs, whether it's COVID-19 or staph (laughs) or um, anything of that nature. Right. Um, Let's see. We have, do you have any data to share if COVID is truly increasing positive DVT rates? Well, that's, yeah, I don't, that's what I'm, I tried to look, I've been trying to keep my um, eye out for that, for those rates. I mean, I think I haven't had any data or studies that have shown a definitive rate of DVT with COVID-19. I think anecdotally, we're hearing um, a lot about patients being on anticoagulants Um, If they're being hospitalized, I think a lot of it has to do with severity of disease, severity of the infection. Um, But I don't know if we truly have a a rate or risk analysis of patients who have COVID-19 and who's going to get a DVT or who's not going to get a DVT. Um, I think it's all still up in the air as far as I can tell from my research. But very good question. Okay, are you um, practicing any extra sterilization practices? And if so, have you seen a significant increase in the expenses um, due to all this additional cleaning? So I think for us, we kind of have maintained the cleaning that we were doing prior. Um, The only thing that we have done um, more so is, again, using a lot more wipes to wipe down door handles, a lot more autoclaving because we're autoclaving our reusable gowns, we're autoclaving our N99 homemade masks. Um, So that expense has kind of gone up. I'm sort of looking forward to seeing, since we are using reusable gowns, if that expense will actually come down for us. Um, And I'm hoping that it does. Um, The other thing that we're noticing that wipes are going to be um, a commodity here soon. So (laughs) one of the things that we have done is we've purchased... um, some spray bottles that are dark colored um, from Amazon. Um, and we have those on backup where we're putting four tablespoons of bleach with 32 mm-hmm. ounces of water. And we're using that um, to disinfect our um, spaces as well. Not the machine, not the ultrasound machines, but like the beds, <laughs> <laughs> but the beds and the door handles and um, flat surfaces. So that's a, cheap, but easy solution to some of the shortages. Great. Uh, what do you recommend for offices without autoclave cleaning protocols? Um, what's the best way to safeguard employees and techs without an autoclave? Um, so we autoclave instruments and um, 
masks and the gowns, um, I guess if you were, I, I guess if you wanted to autoclave, there was some discussion of autoclaving N95 masks. So I think it's important to have a protocol for your staff if you're using N95 masks or masks in general, um, what do you determine is soiled? Um, what's your availability to have your staff be able to use one mask a day or uh, replace a soiled mask? Um, I, I'm not sure. It, not, autoclave is not a necessity, but I think it's um, a nice option to have um, for patient or for your staff, if, especially if you can reuse your masks. That, that's the biggest thing that we've found to be helpful. Um, but again, if you don't have an autoclave, you know, having the protocols in your practice for your masks, whether it's when, when do they determine to be soiled and um, when do you replace them? Great. Now, is the autoclave procedure any different or more intense um, in light of COVID or is it just the same old process? It's the same old process. It's just more things to autoclave. So um, we've actually utilized some other people who normally don't autoclave in the practice to learn how to autoclave so that we can kind of keep it running. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> well, this is an interesting question. Is it really necessary to perform ultrasound exams on COVID patients if the patients are being anticoagulated anyway? Well, um, I think in general, um, the biggest rule that you can have um, in terms of examinations is, is it going to change the management of the patient? Um, you know, if I think that was, that's the first question that needs to be asked. Um, if, if your management changes it, um, and then, you know, let's say a patient is anticoagulated, they're starting, they're having a bleed, um, and you need to stop anticoagulation, um, but you want to make sure that they do not have a DVT, um, if that's the reason they were anticoagulated to begin with, I really think it's important to first determine whether or not it's going to change the management of your patient and then determine if the test is going to be appropriate. Great. Um, I think we have uh, time for one more question. Have you seen an increase in venous stasis with COVID patients? Um, they've seen a lot of PE slash heart issues, wondering if it translates lower. So I don't know if I can definitively say that or even anecdotally. What I can say anecdotally is that I feel like patients have avoided seeking medical care in these last few months. And so I do feel that the intensity of venous disease has increased in terms of the depth of ulcers, the intensity of the ulcer, meaning, um, you know, the, the level of destruction of the tissue. Um, I think patients have put off a lot of their care. And so I feel like the level of venous disease, is much more severe um, than what it was before. Thanks again, everyone, and a very special thank you to Dr. Agarwal for her presentation today. Please feel free to contact IAC with any questions that were not answered during the Q&A session. To receive continuing education credit for attending this webinar, please complete the survey. The survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of the live session and also be available from the IAC webinar portal for three business days. On the left side of the My Account page, you'll click on Webinars. Look for the title of this session, Venus Evaluation and Treatment in the Era of COVID-19, Pre, Peri, Post. Beneath this title, you will click Review Event. On the left, select the Evaluation tab, then click Take Evaluation to complete the survey. Your certificate can then be accessed and printed from the very next screen and any time thereafter through the CE Transcript section on the My Account page. If you have any questions about the survey, please contact us at webinars at intersocietal.org. Once again, we thank you for joining us today and appreciate your participation.